We come to you in life with its various seasons. Some are seasons of rejoicing and some are seasons of um, sadness and, and consternation even for us. Um, at this particular time, we, we think more of the latter, in particular of um, Ariel and her partner Martin and their uh, prematurely uh, born babies, um, Lena and Lily and uh, God. Sometimes when we just look at life, we realize it's so fickle, but at the same time, just so grossly unfair and mm. full of injustice and it doesn't seem right. And we don't have the answers to the questions that we have sometimes, God. But I guess what I'm praying for this morning is that uh, your presence may surround um, Ariel and Martin at this particular time as they go through this unenviable challenge. Um, may, they, may they know that you are there for them. Uh, may they know that their church community here in Morfitt Vale is praying for them as well, which is, which is what we're doing, God, uh, even here this morning. Um, we also think of uh, John and Marissa and their health challenges. And we pray that your presence may simul uh, similarly surround them as well during this particular time. We lift these people up to you, God. Um, and we pray that you may be with the, near to them uh, now as never before. And they may experience you despite the trial. And that's our prayer in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Um, it's, it's a privilege to be invited. Thanks, Marche. Marche actually has to run away now. Um, bye, Marche. He's, he's off to our other church, um, which, which starts in about 15 minutes. Bye. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I do love about church is that we aren't just a gathering of people. Uh, if you actually take the word church as an as a English word, it comes from the Greek ecclesia, which simply means to gather. All right, so when we gather, we gather because we are gathered in the name of Christ. And, and when we gather like this, we gather because of what he has done for us and in us. And when we gather in his name and pray in his name, there is power in his name. And as we do this, I, I want you to really consider what that means uh, throughout when we talk church life. When we take that home with us and we pray for our churches, we pray for our members, we pray for each other, I want you to really consider what that is and to take that idea of prayer and go deeper. There, there are other people in our communities that are, that are struggling health-wise, struggling financially, um, and, and there's other struggles that we have. So be aware of the people around you because these are your spiritual uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to move on. I did put my piece of paper away and I shouldn't have. See, that's why you don't fold up paper and put it away. I'm going to invite Misty Bullis for the children's story. This is my favourite part because I never really grew up. yourself going down the wrong path, going somewhere where you probably shouldn't have, getting yourself stuck or in trouble? Well, I have a story today about someone who did just that. It all started one morning when Mr Bullis and I woke up and we could hear this funny noise. What is that noise? Where is it coming from? Is it the wind blowing the windows, making them rattle? Or did someone leave a door open and the door's banging? No, it's not windy. It can't be that. So I went and looked all through the house to see if I could figure out where this funny, thumping, banging noise was coming from. Couldn't see anything and then it stopped. But a little while later, it started again. I'm thinking, what is that noise? And I thought, 
Mm, maybe it's outside the house. So I went outside and walked all around the house trying to find where this noise was coming from. And I'm thinking, I think it's coming from the backyard. It sounds like something's thumping the fence. Thought, oh, maybe the gum tree branch is banging on the fence. Still not windy, couldn't have been that. So I walked all along the back fence, couldn't find anything. Because I'm thinking, maybe there's an animal stuck under one of the bushes or something. But I couldn't see anything. So I thought, oh, well. And off I went to work. When I got home that afternoon, guess what I heard? The same thumping sound. I'm thinking, oh, there must be something stuck somewhere. And my imagination got the better of me and I started thinking... What is it? Maybe it's the next door neighbour's cat. Maybe he's stuck somewhere. No, if a cat was stuck, it would be meowing. And if it was a dog, it would be barking. And I thought, I hope it's not a snake. I didn't want to think about that. I thought, no, I think a snake would be able to slither away. And I don't think it would be a bird because a bird would be flapping, not thumping. So I thought, hmm... Yeah, it could have been. So I thought, maybe if I look over the fence into the neighbour's yard, maybe I'll see something. But I'm not very tall and I couldn't really see over the fence. So I couldn't see anything. And then when Mr Bullis came home from work, I said, go and have a look over the fence. I'm pretty sure the sound is coming the other side of the fence near the vegetable garden. So he got the ladder climbed up it so he could see over the fence. Now, let me explain something about our back fence. We have we put a fence in when, when we built our house and then the neighbours at the back, they decided to build a swimming pool. But there are laws about fences for swimming pools. They've got to be the right kind of fence and the right height and a gate on it. So they had to build another fence to fence off their swimming pool. So here's our back fence and then there's their back fence and in between the two fences there's a gap about that wide. Hmm. When Mr Bullis looked over the fence, sure enough, there was something stuck in that gap between the two fences. What do you think it was? Anyone want to have a guess, Rufus? No, it wasn't a snake, thank goodness. No, it wasn't a dog. Zara? No. A penguin? I don't think so. (laughs) Do you know what it was? It was a kangaroo. Here's this kangaroo stuck between the two fences on its back feet in the air. Do you know what the thumping was? Every time it tried to turn over to get up, it would go thump, thump, thump on the fence. Uh Uh-oh, we're going to have to help this kangaroo. But kangaroos have strong legs that kick. They have sharp claws and sharp teeth. So if we try to rescue it, it's going to struggle because it's scared And we could get hurt. So I had to find someone who would come and rescue the kangaroo. So I called the wildlife rescue people and out came a man in his van. And he came and had a look and thought, yes, I can get him out. So he threw a bag over its head so it couldn't see what was going on. Picked him up, carried him to the van and then drove him back to the bush where he should have been. So the kangaroo was rescued and the thumping stopped. Now that kangaroo was hopping through our backyard in the dark and probably shouldn't have been there. I'm hoping there wasn't something chasing it. But he wasn't where he should have been. And that made me think of people. Maybe it was lost. But hopping through a backyard in the dark... Jumping over a fence, only to find another fence in its way, wasn't a good idea. 
So as people, sometimes we wander off the path of life. Sometimes we end up where we're not supposed to be. But Jesus has a path for us. And if we read God's word, if we read the Bible and we read the stories about what Jesus said and about what he did and read the stories about all the other people in the Bible and their experiences, we can learn the right path to take in life and hopefully we'll stay out of trouble. But if we do get into trouble, who's there to help us? Who's there to rescue us? Jesus is always there to help us out. Okay, guys, you can hop back to your seats. Thank you, Mitzi, for that children's story. God is good. Thank goodness that kangaroo was okay taken back to the bush. Um, speaking of how good God is, let's sing Goodness of God. So if everyone wants to get up on their feet and sing with us.
beautiful church. Amen. Thank you. Uh, let's keep standing as we sing Cornerstone. Good morning again. Next week we have communion, which will be the last in our series called Unspoken. But today I would like to continue. And I want to get a little bit pointed. Yeah, he. Unspoken 3. I feel like we're in a franchise of a movie. Unspoken 3. I'm not that creative. Um, when, we, when we look at Jesus, 
He says an awful lot and his, his words have meaning. When we look at the Gospels, there is a significant amount of his words that, that are really, really important to us as believers. But what we don't see, what we often overlook are his actions. And when we look at leading and being a disciple, we need to look at who Jesus really is so that we can follow in those footsteps and those actions. When we first started this, we looked at Jesus welcoming children. We actually understand that when Jesus does this, he's actually welcoming the family as well. Because the moment you welcome the child, the parents are actually interested. The moment you see the child, the parents know they're in a safe place for their family. Accept the child, you welcome the family. The child mucks up, the child does something, we reject that child, we actually kick out a family. That's the long and short of what happens in that, in that scenario. And so we as a church want to be known as a place that welcomes children because we welcome families. And because we welcome families, we, we welcome parents. And because we welcome parents, we welcome grandparents. And because we welcome grandparents, we welcome great-grandparents. You see how that works. Jesus uses the concepts within his own culture to explain things. He uses the mountain. And he uses those concepts to reach out and touch those who we consider outcasts. He uses Old Testament theology and Old Testament ideas to teach and reach Therefore, I suggest, as a church, we must welcome children. Not as we want them to be, but as they are right now. Now, I can easily make that a statement of we welcome people as they are right now. Be prepared as a church to reach out and touch society's untouchables. Jesus was never comfortable in social normatives of culture. Jesus did everything he could to break down normatives that pushed people to the outer. He did everything he could to bring people in to his inner circle. So be prepared to be uncomfortable. If you want to be a disciple, be prepared to get uncomfortable. If you want to follow Jesus, be prepared to get uncomfortable. If you like your comfort zone, if you like your pew, if you like where you are right now, maybe following Jesus is not for you. Potluck, who loves potluck? We don't have potluck today, but we do have soup and buns afterwards. Yeah, stay for that. I like my food. Maybe too much. You didn't have to agree. (laughs) Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds, he being Jesus. Immediately, really interesting word, intentional, timely, immediately, he made them... This is a really interesting word. That's it in Greek. Because you all know your Greek really well. So I just stuck it up there. He made, that's, that's the word. What does that say? He made. I would argue it says something entirely different. <laughs> that was brilliant. Say that again. <laughs> no. According to John Nolan, and and I've I've checked this with a couple of different sources, but he was the first one that sort of came up. Made should be translated like this. Forced is the most common usage of that word. 
Does that sound like Christ? Forcing. What if it's to teach? What if this is to, to teach something to us? What if he's actually got a plan? And what if he needs his disciples to get into this boat and go before him? He has an intention. There is intentionality to what is going on. And being the, the, the rabbi of his disciples, he has the right to actually utilize this concept. And he says, you know what? I know you guys want to hang around. I know. And the, the way the fact or the simple fact that he uses the word forced you kind of get the idea the disciples weren't keen on this. Jesus sent the crowds away so that he could be alone. Jesus actually wanted to do something very, very intentional without witness. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself. Remember when I was talking about the Mount of Olives, uh, not the Mount of Olives, the the, the Sermon on the Mount last week, we suggested, because this is not that far past that, we suggested it was a gentle hill. Well, quite frankly, where they think this occurred was not that far away from the Sermon on the Mount. There's no great mountain. Again, the purpose of this is to utilize the mountain for a purpose. He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was by himself. He was alone. Jesus chose to spend time in prayer. Jesus chose to spend time by himself in prayer. That does not mean to say he never spent time in prayer with a group. But he chose times to actually pull away to regenerate himself. Disciples that do not pray... Do not follow. If you call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ and you don't spend time in personal prayer, let me tell you something, you are not following Jesus. Because his actions matter. Disciples that don't... The collective, the ecclesia, the gathering never have time to pray. Disciples that do not trust the people around them don't have time to pray because they were actually worried about what the person around them is thinking about them. You're sitting here thinking, well, what what does that person actually think of me? You're worried about what they're up to. Well, that person's doing something they shouldn't. Now I get to judge that person because they're doing something they shouldn't. I get to isolate and then potentially, because I'm human, and that's one of our favourite things to do is isolate and then politically gather a group around us and then sort of go, well, that person over there, look at Trevor, he's looking at a camera. How dare he do that in church? It's a good camera. (laughs) But you you see how quickly we can do this. The truth of the matter is, instead of going to that, we should turn and take the time to step away and say, you know what, I will pray. We see the family that comes in, they're a little unruly because, you know, it's been a hard week. We don't know what their week's been like, but it's been a hard week. The kids are uh, are a mess and they're they're running around and carrying on and tearing the church to pieces. Oh, those stupid parents. Instead of standing up and going, hey, can I give you a hand? What do you need? I see you're doing a bit tough. If you don't have time to to follow Christ in prayer, you're not going to trust the people around you. In fact, you're going to work out ways to other yourself from the people around you. And then you're going to criticize. And you will never have the time to pray. You want to be a disciple? Learn to have time to pray. There was a book written a few years ago, Too Busy Not to Pray. I don't remember who wrote it. I never read it. I read the title and went, hey, there's something in that. I don't need the rest of the book. Learn to have time to pray. 
Of course, we want to get back to the boat. Does anyone sail? Anyone, anyone sail? I know there's a few. I love sailing. In fact, when I was, when I was in South Queensland, we, we used to take summer camp on sailboats, little, little ones, not big ones. And, and we used to do it on the same dam that we did water skiing. Yeah. What do skiers hate? Wind. What do, what do sailboats need? Wind. <laughs> we, we have a hat, or I, I have a hat. There's a few of us, that, three of us that had them. A few, it was three of us. Um, the, the Somerset Sailing Club, and, and the slogan was, I know boats. <laughs> I'm always too embarrassed to wear it anywhere near a boat. But boats. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Some suggest they were sailboats, some suggest they had oars. But I'm going to suggest that being a disciple can sometimes feel like this, Christ has sent you somewhere. How many of you know the Great Commission? Hands up if you know the Great Commission. Come on, don't be shy, hands up, like I can't see. Yes, some of you know it. The Great Commission, what's the Great Commission? Go into all the world. You've been sent. If you're going to be a disciple, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Yes? Church, are you there? Hello, yeah, yeah, excellent. So being a disciple can be like this. You've been sent somewhere, right? You've been sent to go into all the world. You've been sent somewhere. But for some reason, the wind is against you. Do you feel like Christianity is, is, the, is the acceptable place in, in Australia today? So the wind is against you. You've been sent to all the world. Disciples are often put in places that aren't comfortable. The disciples are in an uncomfortable position in a small boat. Now, I want you to think about how many of them were, were fishermen. Half of them, at least. At least half. So if you're, if you're in a group of experienced sailors, do you worry as much? Right, so you're in a boat and you've got experienced sailors, you're not all that concerned. One of the roughest crossings of the, of the, uh, the Cook Strait when I was about, about eight, nine years of age, was the single greatest moment of my life to that point. I did not realise the danger, to be fair. I do not get seasick. My brother does. This was my favourite crossing of the Cook Strait. What I didn't know at the time, we were hearing banging in the hold, and that was because a lot of the cars had actually broken their their mountings and, and whatnot had been smashed up to one side and up to the other side, including trucks and stuff like that. I, didn't, I had no idea how dangerous it was. I had complete faith the captain would get us there. Again, eight, nine years of age, it wasn't. But I remember part of this crossing, just to give you an idea on how rough it was, we would go up a wave and I would jump off the deck and I would fall about that high before I hit the deck again. It was exciting. <laughs> These are not the words my mother uses to describe that same crossing. Um, clearly, clearly, we had a totally different worldview. <laughs> the disciples are in an uncomfortable position. They are in a small boat in a storm. Where's Jesus? He's on a mountain by himself in prayer. And at the fourth watch of the night, so they've been out there for some time, he came to them walking on the sea. Has anyone ever walked on water? Now, I know that if I drag you fast enough behind a boat, you will float. In fact, it might feel like you're walking. I've seen people do the whole, you know, back spins and crazy stuff behind boats. That's just... I have my limits. 
But to actually take a gentle stroll, I mean, I, I maybe might have been a more purposeful walk. Now, walking on wood sounds good, doesn't it? You can actually hear the... Can you hear that? I don't know. Um, but at, at, at the same time, walking on the water, I think that would be interesting. I've surfed. That would be fun. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they, like you and me, would probably have a completely different experience of this. Nobody walks on water. It's not done. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. Have you ever considered yourself in that situation? What would you be like if you're in a boat being tossed about by the wind and the waves and you see someone coming walking to you on the water? What would be your reaction? Wow. Wow. Would, would we have the same scepticism of that person? Or would we think this is just an amazing trick? Depends where it came from. Okay. I want to look at the boat for a moment. Because this is the crazy thing. The boat, for us, is this. It's our known condition. You're sitting there watching something that is completely unacceptable happening in front of you because no one walks on water. Your boat is your known condition. In that boat, there were people that had the skill to sail that boat which means we did not need to rely on anything outside of the boat to get to our destination. You understand? We have the skill in this church to do an awful lot of stuff by ourselves. And if we band together, we can cause amazing things to occur because people are incredible. And when a group of people get together, incredible things can happen. But here's the, here's the thing. We're not asked to do this by ourselves. The boat is not always comfortable, but it is our comfort zone. Am I right? You're in the storm, things are going badly, and you come to church because this is your comfort zone. And sometimes you need a little bit of comfort to be able to continue in the battle. But understand, if you're still fighting on your own, you haven't understood the story. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, don't stress. It is I, do not be afraid. How many of you would be sceptical of that voice? I would be. If this is someone that wants to do me harm, what's he likely to say? And Peter answered him, I love Peter. Peter answered him and said, look, if it's, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. If it's not him, what's he going to say? <laughs> Has anyone ever thought of it like that? <laughs> Slap. Oh, you got me. You got me. Don't stay in the boat. You'll be right. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Let's look at the water. The water is unstable and uneven. I know there's more than just me with bad knees. Uneven ground is not easy to walk on at the best of times. But you make it unstable and uneven. The water is outside my current knowledge base. I cannot affect change in the water. The water is dangerous. The water is beyond what is fair and reasonable. The water is a place that I don't need to go because I'm already in my comfort zone. It might not be the most comfortable part of my comfort zone, but I'm still there and I don't need to be out there. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this for just a second. Marche's not here, so I can say it. He gets annoyed when I... <laughs> when I do this, but that's okay. We were talking about Stormco 
we were talking about where to do storm code. And we, we had the discussion about different towns and whether we go to a place where there is a church or do we go to a place where there's no infrastructure for us and we actually have to rely on locals and work with locals. And we, we let it sit, we were praying about this and Marche came back and he said these words and I, as soon as he said it, I went, this is where we're going. He said, what's harder? To go to a town where there's no Adventist presence and no expectation or to go to a church and slowly build from there. He said, because I think it's harder to go to a town where there's no presence. And I think that's what we're being called to. Because that's beyond fair and reasonable. And as he was talking, I'm like, you know what? I was, this was a, a couple of months ago, I was actually starting to look at this series. And I'm like, if that's not connecting exactly where we're leading our church at the moment. I don't know what is. The water is outside your comfort zone. The water is beyond what is fair and reasonable. In fact, the water is going to take you places because this is the reality. When we look at the water, it usually kills. My safety is now in question. If I'm in the boat, I'm still afloat. If I'm in the boat, I'm with a group of people. If I'm in the boat, I still have my safety net. I still have the, the, the social network around me. I still have people that I can connect with. But if I'm, if I'm looking at the water, there's no one else out there except for except for, sorry, yeah, he said come, so Peter, love this, got out of the boat and he walked on the water and came to Jesus, what's harder, what's harder, to sit in the boat and go, um, look, I think the guy that said come to you is, you know, like he just wants you to drown. It's not actually Jesus, and he's telling you porky pies. What's harder? To throw your leg over the boat and try and stand on water. Or to sit where you are and justify the reasons why you shouldn't. I saw this, I don't know where I saw it, but I saw this um, in the last few weeks. Exercise. I never regret doing it, but I always regret when I don't. I used to play rugby. I used to train. I used to not be a slightly larger person. Um, I used to have a good couple of knees and a neck that wasn't messed up. I used to love running. I used to love it. I was fast. I could sprint over the 100 metres very quickly. I can't now. I've tried. It ends me on the ground. That's the one thing I can't do post uh, knee replacement. I can gentle jog for about from here to the back of the church but I can't run properly. I used to enjoy it. And I used to get out and, and run for fun. Does anyone do that? Yeah. Running's awesome. It's a great way to clear the head. But I always remember this. If you stop doing it for a little while and then you go back to it, oh, it's not as fun as it used to be. You know what I'm talking about. Have you all heard the saying, the older I get, the better I was? <laughs> How many of you suffer from that condition? <laughs> I'm not alone. When we look at the major acts of faith, like Peter 
getting out of the boat, what we're not seeing is the many small moments that led to that trust. We look at the act as if this is a crazy thing because we don't actually understand that it didn't happen like that. This happened because Jesus and Peter walked together. This happened because Peter and Jesus knew each other. The reason why Peter trusted Jesus' voice when he said, come, was because Peter knew Jesus. You don't react like Peter without knowledge of your Savior. You do not act like Peter unless you are prepared to trust the one who's calling. And this, this is why I love Peter. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Have you ever, ever started something in faith? And the first time you see a little bit of trouble. Hang on, where's that boat again? I'm going to go look for that boat. <laughs> Have you ever thought about this? Peter was a fisherman. Am I right? As a fisherman. How many times, and where did he grow up? Around the Sea of Galilee. How many times do you think he'd been in the Sea of Galilee? From what we know, he probably could swim. But I, I, or at least I had to keep afloat. How many of you have swum in fresh water? Hands up if you swum in fresh water. Is it different to the sea? Which is easier? Why? Salt makes, makes you float. Do, do you guys know Pastor uh, Russell Wilcox? He's, he's one of our super fit pastors that does all the uh, triathlons and stuff like that. And we went to ministers' meetings and he said, oh, I'm going to swim across uh, Somerset Dam. And he didn't take his flippers and he didn't do the one thing that you are supposed to when you swim in Somerset Dam and, and that is to wear a life jacket. It is actually a, a requirement by um, SEQ Water, I believe. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think it is. Anyway, he gets out and he starts swimming and he got about halfway across the dam and he thought to himself, this is dumb. This is really dumb. This is really hard. It's fresh water. And all his training up to that point had been in the sea. He made it. He's still alive. It's okay. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering where that story ends. <laughs> this is fresh water. He starts to sink. He could probably swim. He could probably get himself back to the boat. But instead of worrying about the boat, he does something different. He cries out to the one he is looking at and says, Lord, save me. Oftentimes, when we fail, we fall back to our comfort zone. When Peter fails, he falls forward to his Jesus. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, he's talking directly to Peter. Because if he was talking to the guys in the boat, he'd be like, you guys didn't have enough faith to even look at the edge of the boat. Peter had enough faith to get out of the boat. And Jesus, where was Jesus in this entire story? Where is Jesus? He's outside of the boat. So I want you to notice something from a leadership perspective. Jesus is not calling Peter to something that he's not prepared to walk on. It's not like Jesus is sitting in the boat saying, get out of the boat and go for a walk. You want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you've got to be prepared to go into the uncomfortable places so that other people can follow you there. 
Jesus is already on the water and when, when his disciple struggles, he reaches over and says, come on, just a bit more faith and you'll be fine. Keep your eyes on me and it will be okay. To be a disciple, we need to accept our children. Because in the accepting of our children, we're accepting our families. And when we accept our families, we accept our community as they are. To be a disciple, we need to make time for prayer. Because it's in the prayer moments that we start to know the voice of our Saviour. So that when we are called to the edge of our boats, when we are called onto the water that is uneven and unstable and unfair and and unreasonable, we can trust because we've spent the time learning who our saviour is. To be a disciple, we have to be okay with discomfort. To be a disciple, we must be okay with putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions because Jesus never hung around in the comfort positions. He was always testing what it is to be and what it is to love and what it is to go a little bit further. We must be okay with standing on the most uneven and unstable and untrusting surface there is, and that is water. And there's only one way that we as a church are going to do this. There's only one way as a community, whether it be this gathering or another. And I know we have a lot of visitors from up, up Elizabeth Way today. And I know we have a lot of people that will be coming here for, for our youth rally this afternoon. There is only one way as a collective uh, worldwide church of Seventh-day Adventist Christians that we are going to actually follow the three angels' message, the, the, the special message that we have been given to proclaim to a dead and dying world. And that is to keep our eyes on the one who called you. You're not being called to empathy so that you can just sit back and go, oh, that, I, I feel bad for that person. You're being called to empathy so that you can sit beside that person and live with them through their trauma. You're being called to love because love is not easy. You're being called to the things that are, that are going to make you question. Because it's in those, in those moments that you're starting to exercise the faith that you have in your Saviour. And when you start to exercise that faith, you're going to grow in faith. And when you grow in faith, you're going to grow in trust in Christ. And when you do that, things happen. When you do that, you're okay getting out of the boat. My challenge to you, my challenge to you coming up to communion, my challenge to you is this. Make time for prayer. Make time to know Jesus. Because you are collectively being called to walk on the water. And you are collectively being called to reach into your community who do not know Jesus to introduce them to your Saviour. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and sing the song Oceans. Seemed rather fitting. But as they do, I want you to really answer the challenge in your own heart. Answer the challenge and say, Lord, I know I've always been a little bit afraid of the water and I know that's where you're calling me and I want you to pray this song as we sing it together. Amen. Uh, Thank you, Pastor Yo. Pastor Yo chose this song um, and as he said, we need to put ourselves in those uncomfortable positions where our feet may fail but with the trust and faith in God, we will walk. So... Let us stand and sing oceans.
Trust is without a border. It's a scary thought, but that's, that's where we need to be with our trust in God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we understand what it is to be a disciple, to accept our children, to learn, to have time to pray, to be able to stand on the most uneven and difficult services of water. Lord, we ask that we learn to trust you and we learn to put our faith in you and always cast our eyes toward you in the uncomfortable times. But let us never shy away from that discomfort. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.